Hello, everybody, and welcome to Adler Astronomy Live. My name is Meredith. I'm going to be hosting, and today we're going to be talking about advocacy and addressing the issues of light pollution in the city. It's such an exciting program today. I'm pumped. Uh, as y'all may know already, the Adler is currently closed to the public. So what we're trying to do here is bring some of our programming online to you to reach the world. Um, and one of the programs we're most excited about and proud of at the Adler is our Far Horizons program. Far Horizons does everything from research to engineering to exploring everything from underwater worlds to the stratosphere and beyond. So we're so excited to invite some Far Horizons folks here today and to just be talking about light pollution in general and just uh, making you all aware of what's going on. Um, so as you can see, we're not at the Adler right now. We're all just currently in our own homes. And because of that, you might get some fun bonus features such as a technical difficulty or two or three. Who knows? Uh, we just hope that you are uh, ready to have fun with us and we just ask for your patience and understanding as we just work with what we got at home, you know? Um, so with us today, we have some amazing experts and just people that really inspire me personally as a person. Uh, <laughs> we have Rosie Lugo and Ken Volchek. Hi, Ken and Rosie. Hi. Hi. Hey, um, how's it going? So let me introduce Ken first. Uh, Ken is our senior manager of Far, Far Horizons. And for the past 10 years, he helped bridge the gap between scientists and engineers at the Adler and students exploring our world and beyond. Hey, Ken, how are you? Good, how you doing? <laughs> Good, um, I know that we're all stuck in our homes right now, but did you get to see the moon the other night? Actually, yeah, it was really beautiful. I was up on my roof, uh, doing some science and uh, got a beautiful view of the moon. Yeah. <gasps> nice. I love this. Okay, next up, let me introduce Rosie. Rosie is our teen program manager and for the past five years at the Adler, she's been connecting Chicago's urban youth communities with the field of STEM. Hi, Rosie. Hi. Can, can you see the moon from your window? I could actually at night sometimes when it's, I can, it's as if it was a street light. And so it sometimes wakes me up in the middle of the night. So yeah. It's been so bright, and I'll tell y'all, from here in Chicago, you can't see much, but that was a killer moon. <laughs> um, okay, before we move on, I do need to brag that Rosie just won a big award. Um, it is called the Bob Gent Community Leadership Award. This award is given to an International Dark Sky Association chapter or chapter member who has demonstrated outstanding achievement at the local level in combating light pollution and fostering support for IDA's mission and programs. So everybody clap and give it up for Rosie. Yay, Rosie. Thank, thank you. We're so lucky you had time to join us today. <laughs> uh, also um, behind the scenes, you won't see his face, but joining us today is our very own Aaron Geller who will be running all of our visuals. So thank you, Aaron. Um, hey, Aaron. Hi. Yay, Aaron. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so today's program is meant to be totally interactive, which means we wanna hear from you. So please utilize the chat function in YouTube and get your questions over to Robert, who's going to be joining you. So please, everyone say hi to Robert, and Robert's going to get your questions over to us. Remember, no question is silly. All questions are welcome. Please ask us questions. We want to chat with you. All right. I think we are ready to get started. And since we're going to talk so much about light pollution today, how about we just kick it off by, Ken, why don't you just tell us what is light pollution? Well, um, just like any pollution, it's um, putting something into our natural environment that's normally not there. Um, so in this case, you know, most people think of maybe lights at night as being a benefit to society. And it's like, you know, it does. It does actually uh, help us out in our modern life to some degree. But anything that's too much actually can be a pollutant. Um, so... I uh, just want to show you, get an idea here. This is actually um, a map of the world as seen by a satellite from space. Um, and you can actually access this uh, as well. Now we're going to zoom into Chicago. Now remember, the Earth for millions, actually billions of years, would be black, dark at, at night. Um, but what we're seeing here is light emitted from everything from street lights to commercial lights to uh, light uh, that's being used to light our nights. Um, it's only been a little more than a century since we've had so much light um, on our streets. If you think about it, only 
only a little bit more century as electric light really uh, proliferated on our in our cities. Um, so as we zoom into Chicago here, you probably notice, wow, it's pretty bright. <laughs> in fact, Chicago is actually one of the brightest, uh, you know, urban areas in the world. Um, and, uh, but I want you to notice something. It's like, remember, I said this is taken from a satellite. So it's orbiting the earth, looking down, which means all the light we're seeing is light that's shining up into space. It's light that's shining up into the sky. And if you think of like a street light, well, it should be lighting the street not the sky. So it's not a skylight, it's a street light. So why is it being seen from space? So that is an example of light pollution. Uh, light that is overused, maybe misdirected, maybe too much of it, um, and it ends up kind of flooding our environment. So um, in this case, like, you know, you think you put a light out, oh, it might be good for safety. So how about a hundred lights? Wouldn't it be a hundred times more safe? Not necessarily. It's like, you know, you might enjoy a, a glass of wine for dinner, but if you had a hundred glasses of wine, I think you have a problem. So we don't want to be in our modern world lightaholics, uh, being too obsessed with too much light. Absolutely. And Ken, um, I, you can't help but notice, we all just saw, especially from the zoom in, just how bright Chicago is. So we've just learned that it's one of the worst. <laughs> cities Sorry. for light pollution. That's okay. Let's just acknowledge it. Uh, and that's why it's extra important <laughs> that we have folks in Chicago who care about it. Um, and that's where folks like you can and Rosie step in. So Rosie, can you explain to us why is light pollution something we should care about? I mean, it's important for us to be aware of it because it's impacting us as human beings when we're sleeping, um, even when we're working with, through that night shift. Um, so much energy that is being used uh, because we're keeping all of our lights on. Uh, it's a way to, you know, help impact uh, reduction of, of energy. Um, and like Ken said, like the safety aspect of it, uh, when we think of darkness, we usually think that it needs to be bright um, and not scared and not be scared of it. Um, but also taking the fact that if it's too much light, it's also impacting uh, the, what we're looking at. Um, and so with that, it also impacts our ecological system. So our birds is a big impact, um, specifically here in Chicago. So Aaron just post put up um, a migration map. So it's a forecast map, um, not about clouds, but about our birds migrating, mm. specifically in real time of what just happened um, in this case in September. Um, and so it's real time analysis that's happening um, at night from sunset to sunrise and 90% of birds actually migrate at night. So what does that mean? That means that they are depending on the night sky um, to migrate either north or south. And in September, it is the high migration point of birds migrating at night. Um, Yes, thank you for pressing play. The red is a sign of it saying that uh, that's when the sun is setting. Uh, look at how bright the birds are, or how much, how brightness it is, is because that means that there's a lot of birds migrating at night. Mm. Um, and so that's just something for us to take aware of and look at Chicago, right? We already know that it's one of the worst places of light pollution. And so how is it impacting our birds? Yeah, I can't help but notice the, um similarities between the two map of having that bright spot of Chicago and also this bright spot of where birds migrate. So those things don't go well together. Um, okay, Ken, let's talk about some of the things we're doing at the Adler to help address light pollution. Well, um, at the Adler, we're always trying to connect uh, real research, real science, real engineering um, with the real world and with our students and volunteers. Um, and uh, so for about um, 14 years now, the Adler has been launching high altitude balloons. These are balloons, these big giant latex balloons that go up into the stratosphere. They can actually reach up to about 100,000 feet high. And um, we've uh, used that platform. It's, uh, we call it a near space mission um, for uh, students to be able to design and build experiments that can go to the edge of space. So a few years ago, um, you know, we've done over 130 missions, so we got a little bit of experience with this. Uh, we thought we'd challenge ourselves. Um, and we said, is it possible to take uh, a camera system, design a camera system that can fly up to the stratosphere and look down at the earth at night, 
um, and see a, the big picture, the big regional picture, and actually collect data on how much light is shining up into the night sky. Now, you know, you saw at the beginning that um, map done by a satellite. Um, and, you know, what you're going to get is, you know, it's hundreds of miles away, taking images of the Earth. Uh, you can only get so much resolution, so much information. We wanted to see if we can uh, improve on that. So we designed a, a mission called Night Light, which stands for Night Imaging of Terrestrial Environments Light. Um, and it was designed with uh, students and volunteers. And we've um, launched a few, about a half dozen missions so far, test missions, with the ultimate goal of mapping um, the entire Chicago region uh, at night. Um, what you're seeing here is actually a, a GoPro camera. So it's not our actual scientific imaging mission or imaging part, but we put a GoPro camera to, on our missions to get some nice uh, um, video. And what you're seeing is the region at night. Now, from this vantage point of being 100,000 feet up, you might actually see on the left there, Chicago coming into screen. And the dark area is Lake Michigan. So the edge of Lake Michigan, the southern uh, coast there. Um, from our vantage point here, we can see, uh, actually you can, might pick out Milwaukee, north of uh, Chicago there. You can see all wow. the way to Detroit. On the south, you can see to Indianapolis. You can even see out to Iowa. Um, that's what kind of vantage point we get um, with our mission. So it gives us um, an opportunity to do some real science when it comes to um, collecting data to understand what uh, is the effect of light pollution, how much there is, and uh, where it's coming from. Um, wow, just to clarify, are we seeing the curvature of the Earth there, or is that the lens of the camera? Not really. Um, you know, it's what, what you're actually, the GoPro cameras are very wide angle, so they kind of give a little bit of curvature to it. But uh, especially on our daytime flights at, at the highest altitude, you can see a little curvature of the Earth. Yep. Wow. So cool. <laughs> it's not flat. Correct. Um, I actually went with Ken on a launch once and I just want to say that the teens are able to launch a balloon into the stratosphere and they and like Ken has them so well like uh, practiced that they just are like, yep, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And just to watch them go was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. Um, I have a question about that in a second, Ken, but we do have a question actually coming to us uh, from Steve Cosgrove who wants to know if you have any comment on the satellite Tucson study that concluded that 20% of visible light pollution was from street lights, only 20%. Do you know yeah, about this was, study? It was a really interesting study. We remember uh, that those images you saw of the earth at the very beginning of our um, of at Astronomy Live today, uh, that was taken from a satellite. Um, and what they did in Tucson, where uh, they actually uh, installed all LED lights that they can control, um, they did a little experiment where one night, or actually a few nights, where the satellite came overhead, um, they just had the lights on at 100%, all the street lights. Um, and then on certain days, they actually had the city dim their lights to, I think it was about 30%, so only a third of the, the uh, maximum brightness. And from that, and so from the satellite, they were able to say, okay, how much light is still coming out of Tucson? And they found that, yes, um, the contribution of street lights, which most people think like, oh, that's where all the light pollution is coming from, um, is, is the major contributor. But they actually found that only about a quarter of the light pollution from Tucson now, uh, was coming from um, the street lights, which is really good because this is where science can help out society. Because um, if you think like, oh, to solve light pollution, we just have to dim our streets, street lights or something. Well, it's actually more than that. It's commercial lights, it's private lights, it's maybe advertising or billboard, lit billboards. You know, we're still collecting the data to understand what the actual impact is because this could actually drive good policy. Um, and just one little note on this, um, we're supposed to be part of that um, study as well. Once we get the nightlight flight ready to um, go, we're hoping to maybe do a live dimming experiment in the city of Chicago using nightlight. So instead what? of one night the satellite comes over and another night the satellite comes over and you're dimmed, we can do it live. Wait, quick, tan quick tangent um, yes. on my part. How far are we along in Chicago of getting the LED streetlights? I know we're working on it slowly. 
Yeah, over a quarter million streetlights in Chicago uh, are being transformed from old high pressure sodium to these new LEDs that are controllable and dimmable. We are about, um, Rosie, I don't know if you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, almost 80% or more uh, along the, uh, the transition. Yeah. yeah, the last time I checked, we were a little bit above 80%. Great. So it was like about a month ago. That's so exciting. For some reason, it felt to me like, oh, this is probably going to take forever, but it's it's going along. Bit of fun. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for this tangent. Um, <laughs> let's go back to these balloon launches. So impressive. Uh, now, when I went with Ken, I we had to get in a bus and like drive kind of far. So Ken, like, where are you launching these? You're obviously not just launching them from the streets of Chicago. No, uh, <laughs> yeah, that might be a little dangerous. Um, yeah, so to get clear of the air path of uh, Midway and O'Hare, um, we typically go down to Kankakee, which is about an hour south of Chicago. Um, now for our uh, nightlight flights, um, for our test flights, um, we uh, actually, launching from Kankakee would be a little tricky because the winds in the stratosphere typically take us eastward. Uh, now, eastward from Kankakee is very rural. <laughs> There's not many bright locations to image. So if we're trying to test our system, one of the good ways to do it is actually image Kankakee. So we're still far away from the city. Um, so in this case, if uh, Aaron, you could zoom in a little bit. What you're seeing in the background, uh, the green path is actually our flight path from a test flight. The uh, yellowish lights you see in the background is that satellite image uh, that we get data from. Now, let's see what we can get with our nightlight image. Now, you can see compared to the satellite, which becomes blurrier and blurrier and blurrier, um, as we zoom in, we can actually see individual streetlights, almost ever, or not even just streetlights, but any light in Kankakee uh, as an example. So in this case, um, if remember I was saying with good data, with good science, you can actually make good policy. So in this case, you can actually see um, in Kankakee, a lot of uh, small kind of orange lights, uh, right? We're probably residential areas. But if you notice in the north, here, Aaron, go a little higher up, there you go. Um, there are some really bright locations, uh, giving off maybe a greenish light, or those happen to be um, more like uh, commercial areas, like shopping malls or um, commercial uh, parking lots and things like that. So if you were trying to make a, a policy change, our data can actually help you do it right. Wow, incredible. Um, a lot of folks are asking about policy change and we're gonna get to that very soon. Um, but let's talk about, let's go a little bit further into all the different aspects of light pollution that there are. So we've been talking about looking at light pollution from the sky. Can we talk about what it looks like from the ground from our perspective? Yeah, you'd only be getting half the story if we only saw it from above, because you know what, we're not birds. <laughs> uh, you know, we're not just looking down. We actually experience the night sky or the light we see at night from the ground. So getting the stratospheric pictures from night light is great, but it's only half the story. Um, so we didn't stop there. We said, hmm, we want to also uh, analyze what it is for us to experience it on the ground as we're doing the same thing from the stratosphere. So um, along with some students, uh, high school students actually, we designed a, a really cool instrument called GoNet. Here's a GoNet camera, um, fresh off my roof from last night. Um, it was uh, designed and built with the help of uh, high school students um, from our Stratonaut program. And uh, these cameras, what they do is they take a picture. I don't know if you've ever seen fisheye uh, lens cameras, uh, images. They're like these round images that show the entire view, the 180 degree view. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's what these cameras do, but they're specially designed to be super user friendly. You literally just press a button, it powers up, you put it out all night long. It collects images of the night sky and, um, Let's see if we have a really cool, oh, here we go. So here is an example from my rooftop of what the Chicago night sky looks like throughout the night with a GoNet camera. Um, and I want you to notice a few things. Um, the horizon is all around the edge and you can see the, the sky, it's a, you know, a night sky in Chicago. And you notice a few things like as clouds move over, Clouds are actually in a city have a very amplifying effect. So it, when we get a little bit more cloud cover, look how bright it gets. So they reflect the city light back down. Um, and then in this uh, um, little time-lapse here, 
throughout the night. You might even notice the clouds kind of clear up. Uh, so we can actually learn a lot from what's happening throughout a night um, in anywhere you put a GoNet camera. And at the very end, you might even see to the top right, the moon rising, I think, uh, right about, well, oh, there it is. Just popping over the horizon <gasps> right before sunrise. Um, so now, this is the great thing about these GoNet cameras is we were able to build not just one or two, um, but we actually built 50. Um, thanks to a, a sponsor, we were able to build 50 GoNet cameras, which means you can actually take them all over the world. And we have. Um, so I'm going to give you an example. What you're seeing on the left is the Chicago image you just saw. I want you to compare it to the right. Now, Cynthia, one of our Far Horizons uh, staff, went up to the Northwest Territories in Canada, up to the um, to um, Yellowknife uh, to see the Aurora. Now she took a GoNet camera and this is what her GoNet camera saw. Wow. This is what a night sky should look like. You're wow. like, there's nothing there, right? Well, that's because there's no artificial light. Compare it to what we're seeing in Chicago. It almost seems like daylight in Chicago, doesn't it? Yeah, that's what somebody was just saying in the chats, that it looks like daylight. It really does. Yep. Sometimes you don't know um, how uh, light pollution has affected your uh, world until you see it in comparison. Mm -hmm. You know what, Ken? I grew up in a place with very little light pollution and functioned great. Um, mm -hmm. Would go for walks at night with you know just the moonlight and be fine. Like maybe a flashlight, maybe not. Um, but now when I go home, it feels so dark. Like I get really scared driving. I'm like, something's gonna, I can't see what's around the corner. Uh, it, but you know, it's, it's true what you were saying earlier about how we get so used to something and, and we think like, this makes me feel safer. Uh, but actually, you know, that's just a new thing that, that humans are experiencing now. Anyway. Amazing. Um, okay, so let's talk more about uh, the students and GoNet research in just a second. Um, but first, I just wanted to say, if anybody is just now joining us, welcome. This is Adler Astronomy Live. We've got Ken Volchek, we've got Rosie Lugo. They're talking to us about light pollution and light pollution advocacy and awareness. Um, if you are enjoying this pro program and you'd like to help out the Adler, we are trying to raise some money before the end of the year. We're trying to raise $50,000. So far, I don't know if everyone here knows this, so I want to see if you're excited. So far, we've raised $26,000. <laughs> Yay! Okay. Anyway, um, that's so exciting. Uh, that, so we're over halfway to our goal. So if, uh, if anybody is able to contribute more, as you know, the Adler is closed. Um, to the public. So to try and keep our museum going and our programs going, we just need to raise a little bit more money. I do want to give a special shout out to two donors who have uh, donated and their names are Leonard Adams and Stephen McNack. I hope I pronounced that right. Thank you so much, Leonard and Stephen. Thank you for your donations. Uh, no amount is too small. You might want to uh, donate, you know, who knows, maybe $2,000 for the number of stars you can see in a truly dark sky. Or maybe it's less than 100 for the number of stars you can see in Chicago. Or maybe it's just $1 for the number of planets I saw the other night and it was Mars. No amount is too small. <laughs> we are so appreciative of everybody out there who has donated so far. So if you can help us reach that $50,000 goal before the end of the year, we appreciate you so much. Thank you. Um, okay, let's get back to talking about students and talk about GoNets. Um, tell us about some of the GoNet students and interns and what else is the Adler doing to address light pollution? Well, um, just to give one example, um, you know, we always like to, you know, just science is great, um, but you know, if it doesn't have an impact on our lives, you know, you feel like, hmm, why, why are we doing it? So uh, we always like to do uh, a connection between what we're doing when it comes to the science and the engineering and what we can do to improve our world. So uh, this summer, um, those GoNet cameras I showed, showed you, we had a number of high school interns um, that were each given a GoNet. We had a whole internship program where they learned how to collect data. They learned how to observe the sky. Um, and we used that um, and they helped create a report um, for, well, 
we just submitted um, to the International Dark Sky Association an application for uh, the area of Forest Preserve, a 6,600 acre area of the Cook County Forest Preserves called, uh, we're calling it Mount Forest Island. It's kind of southwest of, of the city. It's still in Cook County um, to be uh, hopefully um, the largest, uh, what's called an urban night sky place in the world. Like I said, 6,600 acres, just right, only uh, about 20 miles away from downtown Chicago. And it is a beautiful location. So these students collected data that we used to submit this um, report in conjunction with the Cook County Forest Preserves. And if, like I said, if all goes well, um, early next year, we can possibly have uh, one of the biggest urban night sky places in the world, right by our door. So cool. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to find out. Will you keep us all updated, Karen? <laughs> um, okay, let's talk about YOLO. Rosie, I'm YOLO's <laughs> biggest fan. I'm wearing the Yo my YOLO shirt. Um, <laughs> they're, my, they're my biggest inspiration. Uh, Rosie, can you just tell us what is YOLO and um, just describe to us the kind of amazing things that YOLO are doing? Of course. Uh, so YOLO stands for Youth Organization for Lights Out. Um, it is an environmental justice uh, light pollution awareness program um, that started off in Little Village. Um, and now it's expanded to students throughout, or high school students throughout the city of Chicago. Um, and the goal is to one, bring that awareness of what light pollution is uh, in an urban city, such as where we live right now in Chicago, um, and, ex and allow them to experience what a night sky looks like um, through different, vari through various ways, such as going out to a dark sky place, such as Indiana Dunes, which was the first place that we took the students. Um, a lot of the students had not left their neighborhood or the city, let alone like sometimes the state. So we take, took them across lines. Um, and a lot of them got to experience what a true night sky would look like. Uh, a lot of the students were crying because of their experience. They had never seen it. I think that was very impactful. Um, and then in August, we took the students to Middle Fork Forest Preserve. Um, and that's the video that you're seeing right now that they're looking outside the window um looking at the amazing stars and they were actually able to see the milky way that night um which was great and so we took them to central illinois um and so what we've been doing and what they did there as well was use the tools that they've been learning to use so we have their sky quality meter um where they're measuring the night sky um in their own backyard uh, we took telescopes so they can actually look at uh constellations that were visible in both locations. And they've learned how to use their uh, star map. Um, so to be able to locate, locate what a star, where the constellations are. And of course, they each have a red uh, flashlight that allows them to see at night and not have the really bright flashlight uh, that our phones tend to have. Um, and then of course they have their loss of the night app that they download um, prior to um, as a smartphone is either an Android or an iPhone and essentially they locate stars um, and it's an international um, global uh, citizen science project that allows you um, at home uh, to help us uh, as scientists to locate um, what stars it's asking you to look for um, based on the light pollution that is around you. Um, and so it's an easy thing that you can do and you download it. Uh, there's a little circle um, that asks you to kind of locate. So you kind of move your phone around. There you go, Ken. Oh yeah, Ken, Ken is showing it. Oh, I'll show you, oh, hold on. Ken, you got to talk so the camera goes to you. But for, in the meantime, this is what the, can you see what the app looks like? <laughs> it's a little owl and it's purple and the owl has glasses on. Go ahead, yes. Ken, if you want to show yours too. No, I think, oh. oh. <laughs> um, so we, it's an easy thing to do. Just download it, register for it. Uh, you can also use My Sky at Night. It's a website that allows you to uh, look at other people's 
uh, data that they've used through their sky quality meters uh, with their loss of the night app, globe at night as well. Um, and then to, you can also focus on what is currently happening in Chicago, which is pretty neat as well. So those are the tools that the students are learning to use and informing the communities that they live in. Um, in addition to talking about what policies need to be changed. And so currently we're working with a lawyer to kind of give input on a light ordinance um, that is currently being worked on and hoping to also talk to the alder humans uh, that the students um, have in their neighborhoods. Um, and so, yeah, that's currently what we're working on and it's impactful as well. So it's real science that they get to do in person, um, in person as in, in their own backyard um, and even virtual as we're doing it right now. Yes. So all the folks who are uh, out there wondering how you can get involved, you can do these things too. You can get the loss of the night app on your phone. And I'm looking at you, dad. I know my dad's watching. He's never missed a program. Um, <laughs> and I, he's always going out at night and texting me about what he can see in the night sky. And for those of you who like to go out and look up at your sky, this is just an easy way to quick open up your app and log it and help scientists to gather very important information so that we can track light pollution. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, as Rosie describes, the red flashlight is huge. Isn't there something else about red light too that um, doesn't affect birds as much or am I making that up? Most, most birds, uh, it, it's, uh, some have different kind of vision, but yeah, in, in general. Okay, cool. Better for us. Amazing. <laughs> Uh, and then we have these students who are writing to their alder people and getting some policy changes. And that is something that you can do in your neighborhood as well. And also just spreading awareness is huge. So talking about light pollution is huge. Um, but what can people do in their own backyards and in their homes? I know that um, Haley is wondering uh, what they can do in their home to reduce light pollution. Izzy as well. Um, is it enough if I use candles instead of lamps or could I do more? I mean, should we go as far as using candles? Tell us <laughs> well, what we, can do. we don't have to go to back to the stone age. Um, it's okay to have lights. Lights are a, a benefit to society, but lights like we saw from that satellite image, if it's going the wrong direction, if it's being used wrong, if it's maybe too bright, you're not doing it right. So um, there's a way to to be sensible and be um, good about using light. Um, so as an example, I like to say like, okay, let's say you drove home and uh, you, you arrive back home at night, you keep your car running all night long and you go back in your house and you're like, wait, you wouldn't keep your car running all night long. Well, why do we keep our lights on all night long if they're used maybe to, you know, light the uh, path up to our house or something like that? Um, or maybe you're thinking for security. Um, oh, you have light on the, you know, the garage door or something. Um, well, if you think about light uh, at using it at night, think about it like this. Light is saying, look here, look here. So if you have a light at, over your, your door, over your garage or something, well, for maybe a burglar, they're like, oh, look there. Hey, there's a, there's a door I can break into or something. Now, but if you use light right, maybe a motion sensor. Um, if you have a motion sensing light and uh, suddenly someone walks up that you don't want uh, um, coming to the garage and the light turns on, now it's saying, look here. And it not only, uh, you know, uh, is a shock to the, the person, but also it attracts your attention, attracts other people's attention. And think about it, instead of having a light on every single night for security, um, uh, you could actually only pay the money to pay that electric bill when it's needed. And that's the point, when it's needed is really important. So I'm gonna give you one example, one more example of, like a, of what you can do starting at your house. So, um, so, Okay, you just came home from uh, you know a long journey. You have your car running all. Nope, I've turned my car off. Now you come inside. You warm up your house. It's a nice winter, uh, warm uh, house inside for winter, um, and then you decide to open all the doors and windows. No, wouldn't be smart, right? <laughs> um, because all that heat would just go out everywhere. Well, same thing with light. If you're trying to, let's say, you have a sidewalk coming up to your front door, um, and you want people to not you know, trip or fall or, you know, miss the sidewalk. Well, you'd want to have some light on the sidewalk, not as opening the windows, 
having it go everywhere. Because remember, light is saying, look here. So I would advise, you know, those really low level, um, like foot uh, level path lights. Mm -hmm. So something like that, that the light is only shining down where you want it, because you want to look here, you want to look at where the sidewalk is. Um, so you can imagine if you have one of those like light poles outside your house and it's just shining in every direction, you're shining in people's eyes. Um, you're shining at your neighbor's door and light uh, windows maybe, and you're shining up into the sky where birds and animals are affected and human health can be affected. So think of it like that. Just use the light you need for what you need it. Um, uh, so that would be my advice. Now, if you want to go further, start you know, start around your home. Uh, and if you want to go further, you can always uh, check out the IDA's website, the International Dark Sky Association's website at darksky.org. They have an amazing uh, catalog of, of information for anybody who wants to maybe get more energy efficient lights, better light pollution friendly lights. They'll help you out with a lot of things and, you know, maybe become a member of the IDA. That can help out as well. Yes, I love this. I want to do a quick call out for any last minute questions. Uh, get those in right now if you can. Um, we've learned so much already about light pollution. And yeah, so and there's something else that I wanted to add that I know uh, folks are starting to think about is just, and, and we talked about it a little bit just a few minutes ago, talking about red light and who it may affect. Um, but looking at the different colors of light is important for different species. So you might want to look into where you're living and what species are affected by light and at what time of year, correct? And, and um, think about those kind of things. I know that there's sometimes a call here in Chicago uh, when birds migrate in the fall to close your window shades so that we can try and dampen the light pollution a little bit. Um, I don't know if you have anything to say about those things, Ken or Rosie. And no, I would just encourage you to do that year round uh, mm -hmm. because it's still impactful, right? Not just for our birds, but also just as an ecosystem. Um, and then, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. And I was just gonna say, if you have a street light coming into your bedroom, if you're able to get a really dark curtain or a blackout curtain, that actually helps you as well to work on your um, uh, sleeping better, to sleep better, so. Yeah, that, I mean, I would say in general, a rule of thumb is you don't want blue light. Blue light is the most um, generally impactful to the environment, uh, to ecosystems, and to human health. Um, blue light actually affects our, um, our circadian rhythm, our night-to-day rhythm, uh, natural rhythm that we've had for um, you know, all our evolution. Um, and so blue light actually uh, triggers our body to think it's day, because you think about the blue sky during the day, our body has uh, evolved to... Um, uh, for example, create melatonin, which is a very important um, uh, chemical in our body, uh, only at night when it doesn't see blue light. So imagine if you're staring at a blue light screen or if the LED lights outside your house are really blue, uh, your body actually registers that and can actually impact your, your, your health. So in general, try to get um, warmer color lights if you're at the, uh, you know, at the um, hardware store and you're gonna get some new lights for your house, look for um, what's called the color temperature. Try to get something that's below what they, they use a scale um, and it should be below 3000. You'll see uh, 3000 K maybe. Definitely don't get anything above 3000 K. It's gonna be too blue. Try to get the lowest you can. You can even maybe even find 2700 or 2500 K lights. Those would be much better for you and everybody around you. Awesome. Yeah. And since we've been talking about contacting your older people, um, I know that you all have told me before to think about uh, your street lights and go outside, look at them, look at the color, look at the shielding, see if they're pointing up. And then um, if you feel if they are LED and they can be turned down, how maybe contact your older people and see if you can turn them down, start a conversation on your neighborhood Facebook group um, and say, hey, I've noticed that our lights on our street are really bright. Um, does anybody else wanna sign a petition to get them turned down or whatever it is? Um, awesome, we have a couple questions. Uh, okay, we have Duncan asking, Applications, oh, on the Adler Planetarium website, it says that applications for the next session of Team Stratonauts will open in winter 2020. Is there a more specific date that people should expect it to open up? And can you tell us about Team Stratonauts in general? 
uh, Rosie, do you know the, uh, the timeline? I think it was going to be the beginning, somewhere it's, in the beginning of the year, right? It's definitely going to be in like late January, early February uh, within the application. But just be aware if you don't have our newsletter um, for teen programs, go ahead and sign up um, through the website. You're able to do that. And um, but yeah, just be on the lookout for sure. And um, teams, Team Stratonauts is for teens, right? Yeah, I yeah, can't sign up. Say that again. My dad can't sign up. No, unfortunately. Sorry. Sorry, <laughs> sorry Mr. Meredith's dad. <laughs> um, okay, so January or February. So keep an eyeball out. Sign up for our newsletter. Um, Steve <coughs> Cosgrove just wanted to say good job on Wow Signal. Oh, thank you so much, Steve. Um, Duncan <laughs> says that they remember the bus trip. Somebody else said that they really like that we say alder human. Hey, um, I think that might be it for questions, right, Robert? I believe so. Well, thank you so much. And let's congratulate Rosie once again on her amazing award. You know, we've been talking more <laughs> about the IDA website, the International Dark Sky Association website. That is who Rosie got the award for. So we've come full yes. circle here. We um, sure have. <laughs> it's a huge deal. Were you uh, expecting it, Rosie? Were you so surprised? Were you so excited? I was not. I was excited. And it's also, I've been working with the IDA from the beginning, um, from learning more. I, I, was, I was not an expert on light pollution when I came in. Ken and IDA were a big part of that, um, in addition to other people like Cynthia, Chris. And um, so it was nice to see that this work that I've been working hard with YOLO from the very beginning to now has been recognized because it's important for young people, you know, to, to see that themselves and doing real science. And so that's the amazing thing that I think the work that Ken has been doing with Stratternauts and the summer interns and myself with YOLO and our staff, I think, join us. So. Yes, join. If there's anything you should have learned from watching Adler Astronomy Lives, um, it's that teens are changing the world and they're the best people that we have right now. They're our only hope. So they are. <laughs> and um, Adler teens are doing the most amazing things in the world. Uh, wish I could go back in time, be an Adler teen. But um, instead, I was just renting movies from my local movie renting store and watching those all summer long and playing Donkey Kong 64. So <laughs> I can't go back and change time, but I can encourage others to do it. So enjoy it. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I'm here now and I'm learning so much from the teens. Um, I'm not allowed to touch the balloon when we launch it because I haven't learned. But, <laughs> <laughs> <Don't touch it. laughs> but I can watch. Um, all right. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, everybody. Um, Robert's gonna share some more links again um, about uh, the studying light pollution. Uh, we're gonna share some things, um, let's see here. Oh, the link for donating, once again, thank you so much to everybody who's donated so far. Um, if we didn't get to a question that you think of, uh, please email askadler at adlerplanetarium.org and one of our experts will get back to you ASAP for real. Um, yeah. And I think that's pretty much it. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Yay. We'll see y'all yeah. in uh, two weeks for another Adler Astronomy Live. And thank you to Aaron behind the scenes. Hit it, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs>